our last session in the conference this weekend, and I would like to say before we begin the study of the Word of God, how I've appreciated your hospitality, your fellowship, your friendship, and look forward by the grace of God to spending eternity with you all, one of us be there in that great and glorious gathering. Well, we come in our last session to consider further the work of Elijah the prophet. We saw previously how Elijah conquered at Mount Carmel, how the Lord God sent fire for him, the sacrifice was consumed, and Elijah ran faster than a chariot all the way to Jezreel. And in the last session, we saw how having arrived there, he received the threat of Jezebel, the wicked queen. And this bold, brave, courageous prophet melted down before the threat of a woman. And he ran to the wilderness. He prayed that he would die, that the Lord would take his life. He pouts and he complains. And we saw the reasons. Physical, spiritual exhaustion, ness, blurred spiritual perspective, disappointed hopes. But the great story there was not about Elijah's meltdown, but about God's grace. How God came to him in his kindness, in his gentleness. And remember the psalm I quoted, His gentleness makes me great. And God, in God's gentleness, he revives his prophet, restores him, recommissions him, and sends him back to work with now that perspective, that godly perspective of looking not to the circumstances around, but fixing his eyes, living God. And so, Elijah goes back to work with new marching orders. And let's turn again to 1 Kings chapter 19 and consider now those new marching orders in more detail and how Elijah began to fulfill 1 Kings 19, and let's begin reading with verse 15. And the Lord said to him, 1 Kings 19, 15, And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you have arrived, you shall let Baal king over Aram. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of abel Mehola you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And it shall come about, the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall put to death. And the one from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Verse 19. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, while he was plowing with pairs of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth. And Elijah passed over before him, passed over to him, excuse me, and threw his mantle on him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please, let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Again, for what have I done to you? So he returned from following him and took the pair of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the implements of the oxen and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and ministered to him. Well, let's pray that God would teach us the lessons that we need to learn, all of us, out of this passage and that God, as was prayed earlier, would raise up Elishas to follow the Elijahs who have graying beards and balding heads in our day. Let's pray. O oh Lord our God, we come before you as we thank you, praise you, adore you for Jesus, your Son, our Savior. As we have just sung, we thank you for him, for his blood in which we stand, by which we live. We thank you for him who is the redeemer of your people. And now we know that Jesus, risen on high, has given gifts to men, pastor, teachers, 
And we see in your church those who have been proclaiming the gospel for many years, for a generation. And oh, we plead that there would be yet a generation to come who would still proclaim that word to the next generation and that children's children would praise the name of the living God. Children's children would believe and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And then that their children and their children's children, yea, until the Lord Jesus returns, as you have promised, that there will be a people in this world, perhaps a little flock, we know not, but there will be people to proclaim, to trust, to follow the Lamb. And it is in His name we pray. Amen. Now, these new marching orders that God gave to Elijah, as we have just read, include three tasks. Three tasks. A new king for Aram or Syria, that's Hazael. A new king for Israel, that's Jehu. And a new prophet to take the place of Elijah. Now, the first two actually find in the subsequent history... Uh, apparently with God's permission or direction, Elijah delegated to Elisha. It was Elisha who carried out those commissions. And so really of first importance of those three things, Elijah takes them in reverse order and considers that, and again I suspect, although it's not revealed explicitly, that it was with the direction or uh, guidance of God, that the most important was a replacement for himself. Top priority was another prophet to follow in his steps and the baton as he passes it on in the great relay race of the work of the kingdom of God. So, we begin now this portion with a restored prophet. He again has a task to do for his master and he leaves Mount Sinai with a much better attitude, uh, if we talk about attitudes, his attitude is very different as he leaves. If you could just imagine his facial expression as he's traveling towards Mount Sinai, what, what kind of a face do you think you would have seen on Elijah the prophet? Kind of, you know, his face is as long as, you say, a horse face, you know, his, his jaw is dragging on the ground and he's uh, mopping the floor with his face as he's heading towards Sinai. But now, as he leaves Mount Sinai, there's again a spring in his step. His face is lifted up. There's a, some, something of a determination to his jaw. Yes, my God is king, and I'm still his servant, and there's work to be done. And there are times in the life of every Christian when there's the face down, the, the feet shuffling along, but thanks be to God, there's the restoration. So the restored prophet is going off to do and fulfill the commission of his God. And he starts by calling Elisha to the office of prophet. Now, we're good, that's our topic this morning. That's where we're going to focus. El, the call of Elisha. And if I could give you a title for this sermon, it would be this. Elijah prepares for the future. Perhaps the better title, God Prepares for the Future. Subtitle, Elisha. All right, so we find here, first of all, the call issued. The call issued. Follow Elijah the prophet, now from Mount Sinai, way in the south, up to Abel Mahola, which was a journey of about 440 kilometers. That's what I have in my notes. And I, when I studied this before, I mapped it out. And yeah, this is a long way. On foot. He didn't have a train. He didn't have a plane. He didn't have uh, any other means to get there but by his own two feet. So it took, would take a couple of weeks. Um, you know, if you go 30 kilometers a day, is that about what you might walk? It's, yeah, it's a good journey. And he's going through death. He goes through the southern kingdom of Judah, and then he has to travel through Israel, where Jezebel is still queen, and where her death threat still hangs, as it were, like the axe ready to fall. 
He doesn't tremble at Jezebel anymore. He's not biting his fingernails down to the quick, saying, oh, maybe Jezebel's servants are around the next corner. Why? Because he knows if God sent me to go there, God's going to keep me all the way there until the job is done. His focus is now good and in the right place. So, Elijah journeys to Abel Mahola, and he finds there Elisha. As we read the text again, he departed from there and found Elisha the son of Shaphat. How did he know him? Well, remember, God's guiding him. God has told him to go to this place. So whether he had to ask around, you know, do you know where Elisha lives? Or whether God gave him his GPS uh, direction right to the turn left here, turn right in so many meters, or however he got there, he found Elisha, the son of Shaphat. What was Elisha doing when Elijah came to meet him? Well, he was plowing. And you look at the text, it says, He was plowing with twelve pairs of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth. Although it's not quite explicit in the way it's stated, it would seem that twelve pair of oxen plowing, I can't imagine having twelve pair of oxen pulling one plow. It, the picture seems to be, he's with the twelfth pair. That means eleven pair of oxen are being used by eleven servants. And he's plowing with the twelfth pair of oxen. And they're all at work in his farm, in his parents' farm. And they must have had some fair acreage or hectareage there, some fair plot of ground, because it takes twelve pair of oxen plowing to plow it. Now, why are they plowing at this point? What has just happened? Rain has returned to Israel. The ground is now softened. Before, you couldn't even break the ground with 12 pair of oxen in one plow. Now you've got soft ground. It's time to plan. It's time to get the ground producing again. The land is revived in answer to Elijah's prayers. So they're out working in the fields. He is a, not afraid of work, this Elisha. Now, it seems evident from the fact that there are 12 pair of oxen, and they're all working on his father's farm. This is a little two-bit farmer. This guy has a, a lot of land. He has a good number of servants. And he has a good number of livestock. This is a big operation. You know, he's got his John Deere and he's got his uh, international harvester. I don't know what the Australian uh, manufacturers are of farm equipment, but uh, he's got them all. Well, what is he doing? All right, you over there, you over there. Yeah, work harder. He's got his own pair of oxen. He's working right with them. He's not your lazy striver watching other men work. He's right out there getting his hands dirty in the same soil. Now, Elijah comes upon the scene. They're plowing. So he's got to step through the plowed soft earth, perhaps even moiety. And he heads straight for Elisha. Remember, they're most likely, likely again, these 11 servants. And as you see this man with his hairy robe, with his mantle, charging across the field, heading straight for Elisha, farm territory. What happens when you get somebody new? in town. Who's this guy? What's he doing here? He doesn't belong here. And then, remember Jesus recognized him on, Mount, uh, on the, the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, he's, a, he's a known character. Remember, all Israel get to Mount Carmel. That, that probably doesn't mean every last individual, but at least representatives. This guy's face, you didn't have to put wanted posters on trees. He's known all over the country. That's, isn't that Elijah? Yeah, that's the prophet. Well, what's he doing going for Elisha? They probably all stopped their plows following his track across the field. What's he want to do with the boss? Well, he gets to Elisha. And what does he say? Simple message. 
<laughs> Wordage. He throws his mantle on him. Now this is somewhat mysterious. You know, he grabs his coat. Woof. And he charges off again. Wait a minute, what does this mean? Why, why give him your mantle? What's, what's the point? Well, it's an isn't it? The mantle of the prophet is a symbol of his authority. And this becomes evident in chapter 2 of 2 Kings, isn't it? When he, when he whacks the water and the water parts and, and what is left behind for Elisha when Elijah is taken up in the chariots? Mantle. A symbol of his authority. So for Elijah to put his mantle on Elisha is saying, Elisha, you're the man. When I'm gone, this is yours. You've got my office. You have my authority. You have my labor. The prophet I am committing to your care. There's the call. There's the issue of this call to Elisha to become prophet after Elijah. And so, Elisha understands. He wants me to follow him. He wants me to serve him. He wants me to take... It's evident. Now, how is, the, how is this call going to be answered? What's Elisha going to do? Well, let's follow the story. And he left the ox, oxen and ran after Elijah. Now, that's the initial. He's ready to go. He left the oxen and followed after Elijah. He has something to say to him, and he wants to communicate his response immediately. He doesn't say, i got to think about this. I don't know what you mean. What say when he catches up to him? He makes a request. He says, Please, let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. Now, he doesn't waver, but he does have a responsibility. He's the foreman in charging this vast field. And if he's going to just up and leave, he needs to make sure it's taken care of. And he also has a responsibility to parents who have set their hopes also on their son to labor in the fields and to care for the farm. And so there's a responsibility, not being irresponsible to God in going back to his parents, but he wants to give his parents the honor that is their due and the respect which they deserve. So, but, but notice, he doesn't just say, I gotta go to my parents. He asks permission first. Please. And that would be a good translation of the Hebrew, please. It's a, 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 a an expression of respectful, humble request, not of demand. Please, let me go and kiss my father and my mother. And then there's an expression of commitment. And then I will follow you. He's willing to leave his parents. It's not that he's saying, I love my parents before you. There's a commitment to follow while there's respect for his parents. Now, what's the answer of Elijah to this? He says, go, go back again, return. For what have I done to you? Now, in English, that comes across rather odd. What have I done to you? We could almost read it sarcastically. Yeah, go back. What did I do to you anyway? You know, but I don't think it was sarcastically. I believe that it would be better to read it gently and graciously. What have I done to you that would require you to be cruel, harsh, disrespectful to your parents? What did I do to you that would you think that you had to be disrespectful to those who have loved you, cared for you, and guided you up to this point? What did I do to you that would hinder you? I think, I think that's rather the way to understand and read his question or his answer, rather. Now, so, what's, what's Elisha's response? I'll follow you. Sir, yes, sir, I'm coming. But I want to go and pay my respects and do what is right 
by my parents. So what does he do? Elijah gave his permission and now goes back to his parents. Verse 21. So he returned from following him and took the pair of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the implements of the oxen and gave it to the people and they ate. And this I would title the farewell banquet. We saw the call issued, the call answered. Thirdly, the farewell banquet. What does he do with his oxen? Well, he takes his pair of oxen, his two oxen, and he sacrificed them. That is, he offered them to God, but as the spices of Israel were uh, intended, this, is not, this would not be a sin offering or a guilt offering. This would be a peace offering. It would be categorized in the book of Leviticus. And of the peace offering, this was something that you brought to God as a token of fellowship with God, of commitment to God. But then it would be eaten with your fellows as it were a sign of fellowship and relationship with God and with each other, with the people of God. So he offers it as a sacrifice, but then he gave it to the people and they ate. The religious element of this sacrifice, he's acknowledging God as his God, but there's an element, a horizontal element of fellowship. He gave it to the people. So there's a farewell banquet these very oxen that he uses, he uses. And what does he burn them with? What does he boil them with? Well, it says, with the implements of the oxen. Plows in those days were not stainless steel. In fact, they weren't steel. They weren't iron. They were wood. And the yoke that would have been used to attach the oxen also wood. He takes this, these wooden implements which it took some labor to prepare them. He chops them up and burns them. What's the point? Remember the story of Cortez, that Spanish explorer? He landed in the New World. What's the first thing Cortez did? He burned his ships. Because he didn't want his soldiers having a mutiny or a revolt and saying, we're heading back to Spain. He said, we're here for good. We're going to do this job. Well, he burns his oxen, his immense, and he boils his oxen. He's not going back. No one at the plow and turning back. He's not turning back, you see. He's going forward to serve the living God. Well, the people join. The crowd must have been talking. What do people do at a feast? Well, they eat, of course. Sometimes it gets a little quiet while everybody's munching. Perhaps we're hungry after a day at work in the fields. But after you get a little satisfied and uh, the, the chewing slows a bit, then you talk. What do you think they were talking about? I know. That was Elijah. He threw his mantle on Elisha. Elisha's burned his implements, he's boiled his oxen. What's he going to do? Well, you know what that means, don't you? These prophets, when they throw their mantle, that's the symbol of their authority. It's called Elisha, the boss, the, the owner's son. He's called him to be prophet. And, and so what's Elisha going to do? Well, look, man, he burned his implements and he boiled his oxen. He's not coming back. He's not going to be a farmer anymore. He's not going to be a farm boy. He's a prophet boy. He's going to follow the prophet. He's the next Elijah. They're all... Don't you think? Am I reading it into the text? Well, it's not in the text. But don't you think that's what they're talking about and what they're happening? And perhaps even Elisha stood up at this banquet and said, Men, friends, I've got a new job assignment now. And I'm going to be following the servant of Jehovah. But ultimately, I'm going to be following Jehovah, my God. Do you know what his name means? Elisha. Well, Eli Yah, Elijah, meant my God is Jehovah. Elisha means my God saves. My God saves. He's going to be following 
His God, His God who saves. So our third point. He is going to follow that man who's wanted by the king and queen. He's going to follow that man who has a death threat over his head, who's hated by the Baal worshippers. He's going to leave a rich and prosperous farm. You think some of his neighbors said, he's got a few bolts loose, or a few bricks less than a full load, as we say. Or a few sandwiches less than a picnic. You know, some figures of speech there. I don't know if that's American. But what they're saying is, he's not all there. He's going to follow that wacky prophet, leave a good farm. Didn't matter to Elisha. He was going to serve his God. Now, the next point in the text is, then he arose and Phlyja and ministered to him. And I would title this, The Ministry Begun. It was the farewell banquet, now the ministry begun. He got up, he left the crowd, he kissed his parents, that's what he said he was going to do, and he walks off following the direction that he had seen Elijah go. He followed Elijah, who was maybe waiting for him Perhaps even attended the banquet. We don't know. Doesn't say. But he left the farm to minister. There's the word. And he ministered. He served him. We learn in Second Kings 3 when, uh, I think it's Jehoshaphat said, Is there a prophet of the Lord here? And the answer of the king of Israel was, Yes, there's Elisha who used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. What does that mean? The ministry to Elijah started out very humbly. He's like a hand servant, like a, a man servant. You know, all right, here's your suit. Okay, let's wash your hands. Pours water as Elijah is washing his hands. Very humble, menial, low start. But God has a purpose in that as well as we shall see. He ministered to him. His ministry has begun. Now, what are the lessons for us? And again, we have quite a few of that grow out of these few words. There's a lot to be learned about God and about the ministry and about His service out of these words in this passage. First of all, first for us, is that God is sovereign in calling His servants. Here's this Elisha. He's out plowing. He doesn't have a clue what's coming over the hill. But God has said to Elijah, Grant Elisha of Abel Mahola, son of Shaphat, to be, pro- to be prophet in your place. God has set his hands upon him. God has pointed his finger. There's the man who's going to be the next prophet. God is sovereign. Now, so it is also in the church, although we don't have direct revelation. We don't have the voice of God saying, well, the next pastor for this church is so and so little story briefly. Uh, there's a man that I met in the Philippines who had a stroke and he, he's just recovering to the point where he can walk with a cane now, whereas before he was in a wheelchair. This stroke experience, he had what he termed, he himself termed, a near-death experience. And in that near-death experience, supposedly, and he's from a charismatic background, which will give you a hint, uh, Jesus appeared to him And as he was heading down this dark tunnel and heading out of this life, Jesus stopped him and said, No, go back. I want you to be a pastor. I want you to serve me. And so he survived this stroke and he survived and he's recovering. But Jesus has called him to be a pastor. How do you argue with that? I'm sorry, Jesus didn't call you. Well, you know... What, especially charismatic church, is going to argue with a direct ordination by none other than Jesus himself? Well, that's not our view today. God does not work by such means in this generation. However, he does make his calling known through the church. There's a desire given. Well, that's a whole other topic, the call to the ministry. But I do want to make this point that God is still sovereign 
in giving gifts to His church. Ephesians chapter the risen Christ, the exalted Jesus, has given gifts to men, gifts to His church. Although apostles, prophets, so on, are not current gifts. They ended with the last apostle. There are two that continue. And they're combined in one. Past teachers. Christ, the exalted King of the church, still gives pastors and teachers. And it's the Holy Spirit, we read Acts 20, 28, that makes men overseers. Not the church. It's not democracy. It's not me calling myself vision. But it's Christ by the Spirit, through the church, giving overseers in particular assemblies. And he does this in his own time, according to his own will. We don't understand the will of God, do we? And we don't understand all of his prov- providences. Had our way, we would say, well, uh, the nation would be converted, lock, stock, and barrel. We would see Christ being worshipped in every nation of the globe today. But if you look back in church history, you find the dark ages. You find the ignorance, the superstition, and the wicked teaching of the church of Rome. Indulgences, the popes lording it over to get money for themselves and their projects. And what did God do in the midst of that dark age? He raised up a mother. Well, God in His sovereignty had allowed and brought about that dark age. But God in His sovereignty brought Martin Luther. God works in His own time and according to His sovereign will. God raised up an Elijah out of nowhere, Elijah Tishbite. And now He raises up an Elisha. In other words, I want us to recognize God is sovereign. God sometimes gives to His church tremendous ages of blessing, the time of the Puritans, when there were so many godly ministers in one little island nation. And then God gives times when there are very few and far between. God is sovereign. But under this same heading, notice too that God makes men willing to serve Him. It is God who puts fire in the heart. It is God who puts the submission in the spirit to say, Sir, yes, sir, God, where you will, I will follow. Here is your servant. Master, speak. Your servant hears. It's God who does that in a man. Now, it was a dangerous Time to stand up for Jehovah when Elijah cast his mantle on Elisha's back. What was he calling Elisha to? Elisha, I want you to follow me. You mean, follow you? Yes. You mean, with Jezebel threatening your... Yes. You mean, if I follow you and her goons catch you, they're probably going to scoop me up in the same net? Yes. You mean... To follow you, even though the Baals are still the popular ones, and there are only 7,000 of us Jehovah's? Yes. What does Elisha say? Let me kiss my mother and father, and I'll follow you. It's not easy to be a pastor even today. Young men, you considered... Not all are called, of course not. But have you considered, even asked the question, might God be gifting and calling me to serve in His church? So many young men I've met in the U.S. and the Philippines never even asked the question, well, of course I should get a job, of course I should make money, of of course I should have a family, of course, of course. Perhaps God is calling you to the ministry. Perhaps God is calling you to the mission field. So many don't even think about the question. But I want to say this. It's only the God who made the world who can make a minister of the gospel. 
How many times did I hear Pastor Al Martin say that? It's only the God who made the world a minister of the gospel. One who will give up farm, riches, vast plots of land to follow a lonely prophet and serve the living God. That doesn't happen by nature. That's the work of God to make a man a true servant. Oh yes, somebody who wants to stand up front, crack a few jokes, make people happy, and then go home, everybody shakes your hand at the door. That was a good sermon, Reverend. You can find people to do that. Just like you can find people to be comedian entertainers. But to find somebody who stands not to please men, Paul's words are significant. If I were here to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. It's only God who can make a minister of the gospel sovereign. And therefore, we have to cry to the Lord of the harvest that he would, he would send forth laborers into his harvest field. But if this is true of the ministry, remember, to be a minister, you have to be a Christian first. And it is if we start at the beginning of the tale, only the God who made the heavens can make a Christian? It's only the God who said, let there be light. Who can shine light into dark, selfish, sin-loving, pleasure-loving, lust-loving hearts and turn them from darkness to light? Yes, we proclaim the word. Faith comes by hearing. And that's why it's our job to proclaim faithfully, fervently, passionately the gospel of Jesus. But no preacher, however eloquent, can make a man a Christian. That's why we pray, because it's only God who can save. And remember the calling to be a Christian, young people. I don't want to, I'm not, I'm not going to paint a glorious picture. The call to be a Christian is not come, take up your harp and follow me. Now the harp comes. But that's not where it starts. It's come, take up your cross and follow me. That's a call, as Paul says, suffering. Through much tribulation, we must enter the kingdom. It's a call to, perse- to face persecution. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But it's a call to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's a call to forgiveness. It's a call to pardon. It's a call to acceptance with God in His family as a son, daughter of the living God. It's a call to heavenly riches. It's a call to that God of whom it says, in His presence is fullness of joy. It's the call of the gospel. But still only God can take a muck-loving, mire-dwelling, infested with all of the mites of sin, sinner, and bring him up out of the miry clay and raise him on high. That's the marvel of what God does when the gospel is preached. Only God can make a Christian. Only God can make a minister of the gospel. That's the first point. Therefore, the application of that first point is, pray the Lord of the harvest. We need a new pastor for our church. Well, let's ring up the seminary. You don't know what you're going to get there. But God, God, send us a man after your own heart. Only God can give a minister the gospel. The second thing, and I want to spend a little more time. Let me see. I think our time's going. I just looked at my watch. Can I go a few more minutes? Please do. Thank you. I have. What kind of men does God call to the ministry? God calls, first of all, a man of diligence. 
Men of diligence are needed in the ministry. Lazy men need not apply. What was Elisha doing? Was he sitting there on the side of the field and working, thinking, you know, maybe God's going to make me a pastor, a minister. Maybe God's going to make me a prophet. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to be a prophet? Young men, some, sometimes young men get it in their heads. They want to be a pastor and they just kind of wait on the sidelines until somebody recognizes their usefulness and gift and says, oh, we would be so blessed if you would be our pastor. It's not going to happen. Get up off your duff and start working at whatever calling God has given you today. He's following a plow. Think about the history of the great servants of God. Jesus labored, it seems, in the carpenter shop of his father. Because it says, wasn't his father a carpenter? What did he do before he was 30? Twiddle his thumbs? Of course not. What about David? What was he doing before he's called to be king? I'm going to be king someday, la-di-da. He's taking care of his sheep. What was Joseph doing? I'm going to be second in Egypt. Well, while he's working for his father, dreaming his dreams, he's still working for his father. And then when he's captured by his brothers and slave, and it's such a tragic thing to be sold by your own brothers. Does he sit and pout, my brother sold me? He's a slave. And so he goes to Potiphar's house. Potiphar says, do this. He does it. He says, yes, sir. And he even does more than Potiphar asks. And Potiphar leaves him in charge. And then, of course, you know this Potiphar. He gets kicked in jail. What does he do in jail? I'm in jail. He works hard as a, as a prisoner. And he's made chief of the prisoners. You see the point? These men whom God used mightily in his kingdom were diligent wherever they were. And so, young men, if you're lazy now, how can you expect to be useful in the ministry? I'm talking kids, too. Parents, this says something to you. Train your kids to work. You want your kids to be useful in the kingdom? Well, don't just let them play video games and watch cartoons and get fat rear ends and uh, not know how to work. Well, Elisha, you see, had to have been trained to this work. And perhaps years before, when he was just a young buck, you know, growing up, and his father says, there and slop the hogs. Well, they probably didn't have pigs, they're, they're Jews, but he probably, perhaps he said, you know, go feed the cattle. And he says, no, Dad, I want to watch Star Trek. You know? Didn't happen. He did his chores. I was talking to the farmer pastors here and sharing some of my stories of my friends. I have two close friends in the United States. One was a classmate, Mitch Lush, grew up on a farm in Nebraska. And he's told me stories I just gape at because I grew up in the suburbs and I was the kid who watched cartoons on all Saturday. Uh, I had some chores, set the table, you know, clean your room, make your bed, but nothing like a farm boy. They got up before breakfast, had to go take care of the animals, milk the cows, and come back, have breakfast, then take a shower, or maybe a shower before breakfast, because you didn't want to go to, to school stinking, because you just were taking dogs. And then you come back from school, and do your homework quick, and then you got more chores, and then there's dinner, and there's more chores until the sun sets. Then you go to bed, because you've got to get up early the next morning to do more chores. No cartoons. No TV. No time off. You know what? They make good pastors because they know how to work. They know how to work. Keep their nose to the grindstone. Keep going. We're going to do the job. Parents, and here's what I'm pointing at. Parents, train your kids to work. You don't live on a farm. Maybe you've got to give them jobs that aren't so important. I know a little girl who was taught that she had to fold the napkins. She hated it. Well, why fold the napkins? We, we're going to just get them dirty. This is paper napkins. Fold them in half before you put them at the table. Why do I have to fold the napkins? Well, the principle was doing jobs you don't like builds character. And she's quite a character today. 
Teach your kids to work. Do you want them to be useful in the kingdom of God? Perhaps you, under God, be His instrument. Not to save them. We can't save them. We use the tools. We preach the gospel. Faith comes by hearing. We live the gospel. We show them that the gospel is a blessing. It's only God who can take it to their heart. But we can prepare them by the upbringing. And that takes a firm hand. Parents, not this loose, you know, do what you want. Go ahead. Watch cartoons all day, see if I care. Now, I'm not saying it's forbidden to ever watch cartoons. I'm not saying it's ever to play a video game. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that's all rub. Yeah, there's time for play. But make sure your kids know how to work. That's the point. A firm hand. Godly discipline. Loving hand, yes, but firm. That's the first thing, a man of... Secondly, though, they, they need to be men who are firm in the faith with a firm commitment to God. Now, notice what Elisha did when Elijah throws the mantle on him. He doesn't dither, he doesn't uh, stutter and say, but, 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 wait, 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 wait a minute here, what, what, do you, what do you want out of me? He said, he runs after Elijah, just a minute, I'll say goodbye to my parents and I'll follow you. Right then and there. No wavering. No turning back. No saying, I'm not sure about this. He was a man of firm commitment. Now, maybe you thought of a text that talks about following a plow and... How many thought of that text? I did. Luke 9, 61, where Jesus said, uh, telling the story, another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. Oh, sounds like Elisha. Luke 9, 62, But Jesus said to him, No one, after putting his hand to the plow, the plow of the kingdom, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Is that Elisha? Now, it's very evident from the case Jesus describes that this person who says, Wait a minute, let me go back. Where's his heart? Is his heart in following Jesus or in going back? Evidently, his heart's in going back. Wait, 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 but, but, let me... He's looking for an excuse. But with Elisha, that's not the case at all. With Elisha, his commitment is, I'll follow you. But let me first fulfill my responsibility and pay the respect to my parents, which is their due. And Elijah gives his permission so the issue is commitment. I'll follow you. And it's seen really in what he did with his oxen and with his plow. Now, I'm not a farm boy, as I said. We had dogs, and I loved my dogs. I mean, I wept when our dog died when I was about 12 years old. I wept inconsolably. Now, I can just imagine if I plow of oxen that I might grow somehow attached to those pair of oxen. These are my oxen. I say, gee, they turn this way. I say, haw, they turn the other way. They know my commands. They, I don't even have to talk to them and they know what I'm thinking. And what's he going to do with those favorite oxen? He boils them. And his plow implements that perhaps he had carved or cut by his own hands. It's history. Burns it up. You see the point? No turning back. My eyes are steadfastly fixed. My jaw is set. My towards following Jehovah. Is that commitment? If it's not, I don't know what commitment is. He burns his boats. He burns his bridges, his implements. And he's going to follow Christ. Now, brethren in the ministry... There are many who will say, well, I'll give this a try. And of course, as I mentioned yesterday, God gives his guidance step at a time. And there may be an indication if there's a health problem or if there's some other need when a minister might need to take time out. But ultimately what I'm saying is, this is it for life. I will serve my king. Now, I want to note one more thing about his parents here in this connection. We have no record of his parents hindering him. When he went to mom and dad and said, Mom and dad, 
I'm sorry, I've been serving you, I've been helping you, and I know you really would like me to stay on the farm. But Elijah the prophet has come and mantled over me. Mom and dad, I've got to follow the prophet. There's no record in the text that mom and dad said, Well, wait, wait, you can't leave us now. You know, you, you can, can't you find a nice pastorate here close at home? You, know, you could be a pastor, okay, but just here in the village, Abel Mahola, we need pastor here. There's no record that they put any breaks on Elisha following the call of God. Parents, do you have your children with an open hand? Will let them serve Christ? You know, what my friend, Arif Khan, said before he was killed, some time before, he said, Alan Dunn, if Muslims are going to be converted, if we're going to see Muslim sinners saved, there's going to be bloodshed. We're going to have to pay for it with the lives of missionaries. You read of William Adoniram Judson. When they went over the seas to India, to Burma, they were saying goodbye. They didn't ever expect to see home again. Parents, we have email. We have Skype. A lot easier now. Are you willing that your children go? Maybe at the cost of their life to serve King Jesus? Mr. and Mrs. Shaphat, let Elisha go because of the call of Jehovah. A firm hand, an open hand. Thirdly, and I'll have to go more briefly here, we want to see a man of diligence, a man of commitment, but thirdly, a man who loves men. Now, in their culture, like in the Philippines, it seems it would not be accepted just to run off. In Philippine culture, making paalam is important. You don't, if you're a guest in a home, you don't just run out and say, Oh, I gotta go. The train to catch, bus to catch. It's very important to make proper, uh, give a proper farewell to your host before you leave. And for a host, it's very proper to receive their well. And so it takes uh, some time. You go to the, you have your first goodbye in the house. You have your second goodbye going out the door. You have your third goodbye at the gate. Uh, it takes a while. Well, it seems in their culture as well, you couldn't just waltz off and say, hmm, I'm going to go waltzing Matilda in the bush. You give your farewell. And so when this man, Elisha, is called, He's got to give his farewell. Elisha was thoughtful of others. He was thoughtful of his parents. He was thoughtful of his neighbors for whom he gave this bank. He was also able to get along with working men. He wasn't just the owner. Well, you know, we're, we landlords are lordly. He knew how to work. Notice, he's in the twelfth pair of oxen. He's working alongside the men. When there was break time, he probably sipped his coffee with them. This is a man among men. And if you follow his history, whereas Elijah was somewhat aloof because of his background coming from the hill country, Elisha is a guy that gets along with widows who say, Oh, what am I going to do? My kids are going to be taken by the man whom we ought to. And the other guy says, What do we do, master? The axe head's fallen in the river. And oh, the stew is, is poisoned. And Elijah gets along with everybody. Elisha. Well, he's a man among men. He loves men. And that's also a characteristic of the men whom God uses. They're not off in their ivory tower. Well, I've got to say, I've heard, I've heard the stories in the Philippines of the pastor. He's got the door to the pulpit here. And so the congregation, somebody, worship leader starts the service. They're done singing. And then the pastor comes out. The message from God. And he goes back in his door. And when it's mealtime, well, there's a separate table for pastor. Man. 
What do you think you are anyway, King Tut? A minister should be a man among men. Elisha was vastly used of God. And lastly, he must be a man of genuine humility. Here's the, the son of the landlord out with the servants, not barking out orders, but working along with them. He's not too good to get his hands dirty. And one other thing that I would note here, when Elijah is called, and we don't have time really to go into Second Kings 2, but when God is going to take him home, Elisha is not going to let him go. And when Elijah is taken up in the chariots, or before he's taken up, what was Elisha's request? Elijah, if you're going to leave me, if I'm going to have the weight of this ministry upon me, I need more than I've got. Oh, give me a double portion of your spirit. He was a needy man. He didn't think, wow, got this, got it covered, can do. He knew his need and he pleaded with God. That's humility. Apart from you, I can do nothing. Turning Jesus' words we read earlier, John 15, 5. Apart from you, I can do nothing. Humility. Well, that's what we need in the ministry. How does God do this? He didn't send Elisha to seminary, although to learn, he probably studied with Elijah. It wasn't isolated, apart from the church. It was in the ministry itself, working alongside the minister. I'm spent with the servant of Christ, as much as seven years to track the chronology. He watched, he prayed with, he worked with, he listened to, learned from him. Perhaps Elijah shared the story of Mount Sinai as well as the story of Mount Carmel. You know what I had to learn? Elisha, I fell on my face in the mud. I blew it. And I want you to learn from my mistakes so you don't have to repeat it. He learned from a master prophet. Now, he didn't become a carbon copy. And... Some people say, because I'll, I'll be honest with you, my teacher in the ministry for preaching was Pastor Al Martin. Some people said, well, you know, you sound like Pastor Al Martin. Well, I learned a lot from him. I'm not Al Martin. Not a carbon copy. Who came through the academy as a carbon copy of anybody? We're all very different if you get to know us. And Elisha certainly was not a carbon copy. But he learned from his master. 2 Timothy 2.2 2, The things you learn from me, these commit to faithful men. Well, we need to wrap it all up. We need to close our study of Elijah. What have we learned? Well, he's a man like us for a time like ours. A man of courage. A man like us who's weak. But a man, ultimately, who had a great God. What should we do when we go home? Well, Brethren, pray that the Lord of the harvest will raise up more Elijahs and Elishas for our generation. Not supermen, men like us, but men for a time like ours who know their God. Congregations, churches represented here, pray that God would raise up men. Secondly, parents. Raise your children that if God calls them to himself and then if God calls them to the ministry, they're not going to be playing catch up. Not going to have to overcome a backlog of a pattern of laziness and of, of not knowing how to work and of not knowing how to be diligent and get the job done. Train them. Train them to know the scriptures. And I'm thankful to God that part of my upbringing was a church where scripture memory program was implemented and I can still quote a lot of scripture in King James Version that I learned when it was easy to memorize at a young age. I don't memorize so well anymore. But I learned a lot and it's still with me. Parents, in your kids that when, when and if, if and when God calls them, they're ready to run.
But parents, raise them with an open hand. If God calls your child, I'm talking about especially sons, to serve in Afghanistan, he can die. Elisha could have died. Araf Khan did die. If we're going to see this generation brought to the knowledge of the truth, there's going to be bloodshed. Think about it. To get into Iraq costs thousands of American and allied troop lives. This thing going on in Afghanistan is still bleeding those countries who have sent troops. Thousands. And are they saying, oh, we can't lose any lives in this. They knew it's going to cost lives and they went ahead. Right or wrong? My brethren, we know it's right to bring the gospel to the nations. We have the commission of Christ. Parents, young people, are we ready in the cause much greater than the cause of political necessity in Iraq and Afghanistan? Furthermore, may all of us become like more like Elijah, bold, courageous, strong in fixing our eyes on Jesus. And may God men call men to himself by sovereign grace. You can't, you see, maybe, you're, maybe some young people are impressed with Elijah. Man, that'd be cool to be like Elijah. But you can't be like Elijah until you know his God. Here's a worth emulating, yes. But the first step is to know his God. That's what made Elijah great. You see this story, the title of our conference, Elijah, a man like ours for a time like ours. But you know the best character in the story was left out of the title? The best character is the living God. It was God who made him great. Dear young people, old people, anyone outside of Christ, it is my prayer as we close our last session, not only will you know about Elijah, but you'll know about Elijah's God. Oh, Elijah's God. He's a great God, worthy of our worship, our service, our trust. It's a, worth, a trustworthy statement. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And you may think you're the chief of sinners, but it was more, more of a sinner. And God saved him. God can save you through the blood shed on Calvary of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's come to him in prayer.